Hey, it's Matt here. Today, I want to talk about five key skills in vibe coding. Um, and these follow largely from the same techniques I use when I'm building applications. And I've talked about these before, but I really want to break down the concepts to help you understand how I approach thinking about and building apps. And this is going to be mostly a theoretical video. We're not going to write any code. We're not going to build anything in Replit. Um, but the concepts that I'm going to use really apply to building just about anything with AI. So they're super useful. And specifically, this video is for Vibe coders who are trying to up their game. If you're trying to think about how to build or think about how you can get better, this video is for you. But I don't want to waste your time. We're going to jump right into it. Five skills in Vibe coding. First skill I got here is thinking. Now, uh, hopefully everybody knows how to think. Um, I do it every now and then. It took me a little while, but <laughs> I try to I do my best. So what is thinking? How do we think every day? Well, I think the foundation sort of thought is logical thought. And we've all been introduced to this logical and analytical thinking. We're going to define those as doing something like playing chess or even learning about how the pieces on a chessboard work. And so you might be thinking, okay, well, like it's good to think logically, but actually there are a couple orders of thought that can be thought of as maybe higher orders of thought or more complicated ways of thinking. And a really good example is computational thinking. For example, programming a computer to enforce the rules of chess. What do you need to understand in order to do that? Well, you have to understand how to program a computer, and then you have to understand the rules of chess at a foundational level. So you have to understand sort of the scope and the problem space uh, of, of the game in order to do that. Now, one sort of order above that is procedural thinking. How do I excel at the game of chess? How do I program a computer to competitively play chess. Now you not only need to understand how to manipulate um, sort of language in such a way that programs a computer, but you also have to understand how to be the best chess player. You have to understand how to be a really good competitive chess player. And so if we tie this back to vibe coding, right? When you're building an application, maybe it's a, a complicated application, maybe it's a simple application. Even if you're working on something that's like, I don't know, splitting tips at a restaurant, you have to understand all of the edge cases. You have to understand the product itself. You know, what makes a good tip splitting application? What makes uh, for a really good user experience sharing with your friends? What will people actually engage with and respond to your, uh, you know, sort of requests for splitting the bill? Um, procedural thinking and building with AI is sort of like being your own product manager. You have to break down all of the requirements. You have to break down all the functionality of this application. And then you actually have to go implement it. So you're both the product manager and the engineer. And that requires like really uh, high levels of thought and being able to, at the core, understand what you're trying to build. Now, one thing that ties into this is frameworks. One thing I always tell people, you don't know what you don't know. So if you're trying to build an app and you're asking AI to like, say you want like a drag and drop interface in that app and you're asking AI like, hey, help me build this thing. I want a drag and drop interface. You have to help me design it. You could get in stuck in a loop or spend like days, weeks trying to build this thing when there's actually just like a bunch of React frameworks that have exactly that tool. So someone has gone out and done the hard work of like building this open source package that you can already use. Same thing for like animating motion or using components. That's like one of the reasons Shad Cien has been so huge. Um, and so you don't know what you don't know. And the question you have to be asking yourself is, how do I do the thing I want to do? What frameworks allow me to do that thing? What frameworks work best with LLMs, right? One of the things about LLMs is that they have a training cutoff. So really new frameworks won't work well when you try to build with them. That can be circumvented with context. And we're going to talk about that later. But the amazing thing, one of the most amazing things in the world is that if you don't know, you can just ask the LLM, hey, you know, I'm really trying to understand security best practices for building my application. What are some ways of doing that in JavaScript with Express? Well, actually, what framework would I use uh, for my front and back end? I and mean, it's like Express. How would I implement these best practices? Tell me. Tell me all the things I need to do. This is like, there's a part of my life where I was asking people for advice. And then at some point I realized, actually, I can get better advice if I just do research. Well, most of the time, there are also people that give really good advice. So shout out to them. Um, and now I'm realizing, hey, I actually can do even better research if I just ask LLMs first to understand the problem space and then follow up with that. So frameworks are really important, not only languages, but just tools generally. And they're like puzzle pieces. That's why I have this puzzle piece up here. You have to think about the types of things you're building and think about all the possible frameworks, languages, tools, available puzzle pieces at your disposal that you can connect together to build the thing that you want to build. And that re might require more than just a prompt. That might require sitting down, again, to 
think procedurally and understand the problem to get to that solution. Um, now, the next thing, checkpoints and versions. I think uh, if I wanted to be simpler with this recommendation um, or more meta, maybe, uh, we would just think about this as like think in chunks or build in steps or components. Things break, and that's a fact. Things break with AI. Things break when you're building otherwise. You should always be using something called version control. If you don't know what that is, you should look into it. Um, to minimize that. And one way we can tie version control into our building is by chunking up those builds into checkpoints or versions or short little sprints where you say, hey, I want to build this thing. And if it works, I'm going to check it out. If it works, cool, I'm going to move on. If it doesn't, I'm going to go back to the checkpoint and I'm going to try again. Or I'm going to prompt, prompt, prompt and see if I can fix it. If it doesn't work, I'm going to go back to the checkpoint and I'm going to try a different approach. This is a really fundamental concept, but I hear a lot of people that say, hey, I got stuck in this doom loop or I was just sending AI the same message. If you're ever sending AI the exact same message, it's like telling someone to do something, they don't do it, and you just keep telling them the same thing. It's like not going to fix the problem. So again, checkpoints, rolling things back to a different state and trying new approaches, really important. Um, so from there, I think debugging is a huge skill. Um, and a lot of these you might be noticing are just kind of fundamental software engineering skills. But if you're not a software engineer or you're new to building, they might not be that obvious. And so debugging can be a bit boring. Oh, no, I need to, I'm not implementing a new fe feature. I'm just figuring out why this thing is broke. But really, right, we can make anything fun. I do my best to make these videos fun. The goal is to make building fun. Hopefully somebody pays you to build this stuff, but a lot of us, dude, we're just building for fun. We're building because we're having a good time. And so the best debugging is methodical, it's thorough, um, and you can turn it into like a little game, a little problem. And at the core, right, the example I have here, hey, like this lamp doesn't work. Well, I'm going to walk through steps to break down all the reasons why the lamp might not be working. And then I'm going to like figure out one by one if that's what's causing the lamp not to work. Let's take this, like, let's take this more practically. Say you're building with AI um, and you hit an error. Why am I getting the error? What are the possible places that I could look to find clues about why I'm getting the error? This is debugging. And in the next video, I'm going to talk about practical, like actual vibe coding. We're going to walk through some debugging. But the goal is to understand how your app works, understand where the error is. And from there, you're trying to get to the root and then take that and pass it to the LLM to tell us what's wrong. And how do you pass that to the LLM? That's what context is. So what do we mean when we say context? Context window, you've heard that term maybe. That's the amount of tokens an LLM can process at a given time. It's just kind of like the memory, you know? Like if you're telling me, Matt, hey, do this, do this, do this. At some point, I'm going to start forgetting. It's like my context isn't that long. I'm not Gemini. I'm not Claude. Um, <laughs> but, right, if you say, hey, Matt, I want you to accomplish X, Y, Z. And then you just let me go do it. I just hammer it out. And then you're like, okay, Matt, good job. Go do this next thing. I'm probably going to do better work. So context can be the prompt we provide to the LLM, but it can also be a bunch of other stuff because LLMs are multimodal and they can like accept multiple types of media, right? They could be images, documentation, errors, or details about your application. Um, and as I mentioned, because LLMs might have outdated training data, we have to provide additional context. Um, now, the key thing to mention here is that it's not just important what you give the LLM, it's important what you don't give the LLM. So my, my uh, example here is might be kind of half-baked, no pun intended. Think about it like working with a baker. You're trying to make a cake for your girlfriend or your boyfriend. And the baker says, okay, like, well, what do they like? And if all I talk about is myself, and I'm like, well, you know, I really love going to the gym, sci-fi, books, country music, and, you know, my favorite kind of cake, cake is chocolate cake. And so, like, maybe it would be like a big chocolate cake with weights on it. Like, I, I don't know. It was going crazy here. I'm probably not going to get a cake that my girlfriend likes, right? But if I give the baker the right context about the actual thing that's important, we actually focus on what we're trying to do and we only include the information that's relevant, maybe I actually provide really good information. And then at some point, I just go off the rails and start talking about myself. It's probably going to get like confusing, right? Because we have this limited context window. Uh, so if you're talking to somebody and you give them multiple conflicting pieces of information, very unlikely you're going to get a good response. So interacting with AI, it's all about being selective, not only with what we provide, but what we do not provide. Also, I'm single. Just want to throw that out there. So this um, thing about context, very important. It's one of the centerpieces about building with AI. And as we walk through my demo in like the next video, um, you're going to see how I provide context to AI, to LLMs, to get what I want. Um, so last thing, 
right? Getting to an MVP and implementing new features. What does all this mean? Let's tie it together. So we want to give AI only the information relevant to the MVP. We want to start small and work up and provide foundational context and important details, only important details to get there. Now, once you have an MVP, you want to build new features, then we're providing context relevant to the new feature. We're probably creating new chats or clearing the context to make sure we're only talking about what we want to talk about. We're mentioning frameworks, providing documentation. A lot of AI tools, Replit being one of them, has explicit ways of scraping documentation, attaching image, attaching images, but we want to also be explicit in giving actual implementation details. So if you find a page and you're like, I want to use this framework, and on the page it's like literally, this is how you will use the framework, import the library, whatever, copy that page or copy that snippet because that will be very useful for AI. And of course, making inter incremental changes. We already talked about debugging. You're going to run into errors. It's important. Why is all of this important? Because it creates sort of this like loop, right? So say we want to build a feature. What's the first thing we do? We prompt to get to the feature and then we test it. Does it work? Pretty likely you're probably going to get an error. Now, AI is getting pretty good. Maybe you don't get an error. That's great. If, it, if you don't get an error, you checkpoint and you move on to the next feature. Great. Say, you know, you do get an error. We go to our debugging skills and we're prompting. We're adding different contexts. We're trying different things. Maybe we roll back a few times to different checkpoints. Then we get to something that works. We got a checkpoint. Amazing. We move on. So it's this iterative process, these feedback loops of building, testing, debugging, and moving on, all providing different context, all thinking about um, how we can basically manipulate tokens at a high level. We're thinking about the pieces of information. It's all about information that we can put together to get this statistical model, because that's all AI is, these agents to get to our goal. Um, and so at a high level, this is vibe coding. And so vibe coding is like we talked about, a procedural thinking exercise where you're defining the problem space, you're defining what you want to build, and then you're breaking it down and going through these feedback loops to get to like checkpoints along the way until you reach an end destination. And along the way, what you want to build probably changes. You probably come up with some new ideas. Um, maybe you realize you're not even building the right thing in the first place, and that's okay because you learned and you can carry that into your next experience. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you're going to get better at critical thinking. You're going to get better at... Um, visualizing what you want, breaking problems down into discrete steps, um, and then, again, managing an AI agent to go build those things for you. Um, but this has been sort of my five skills in vibe coding, how I think about building when I approach these problems, and the things I think are the most important for new builders who are trying to get into this stuff. But again, I'm Matt. I hope you build some amazing apps. AI is getting really crazy these days. You should give Replit a shot. That's where I work. We make some good stuff. Um, share it with me if you build cool stuff. But until next time, peace.